illustrate how to select tapered roller bearings, we're going to do an example. And this is an example that shows a gear reduction unit. And this gear reduction unit has a gear that is mounted to the outside of a housing. You see a little shoulder right there that was pressed up against. And force is transmitted through that gear. And one of the forces that's transmitted is 250 pounds. And luckily, someone has already figured out what the components at the left and the right side are. And that is we have 875 pounds pointing downward on the left bearing and 625 pounds pointing downward on the right bearing. And so you can see that these bearings are indirect mounted, but because the force is applied through this outer housing, there is an outer housing that rotates around a stationary shaft. And so the bearing reactions are gonna be pointing in this direction as shown, which means that they are going to end up generating an induced axial compression. Now, the other thing that happens is before we even consider that induced axial compression in that shaft, we are going to take a look at which bearing is squeezed by the external applied axial load. And you can see that it is the bearing on the left side over here that is squeezed. And so that's the bearing that becomes labeled A. And the bearing on the right, we label B. But before we do anything else, we have to estimate the induced axial loads that are generated by the bearing at A and the tapered roller bearing at B. We are going to assume that this is a Timken, and the key thing here is we're going to need this lifetime. The Timken lifetime is 90 times 10 to the 6th revolutions or rotations of that shaft. And let's just go ahead and imagine that we have a 90% reliability for each of the bearings. Let's not go through the Weibull shifting calculation right now because I just want to illustrate how to select the tapered roller bearings. So the first thing that we have to do, because we have yet to select a tapered roller bearing, the induced axial force, F induced at A and F induced at bearing B, and that induced axial load is brought about by the radial load that is applied to it. And the equation that we use is 0.47 times the radial load that's being applied divided by K, and we are going to assume as a start that K is equal to 1.5. We do not know what it is. We don't know it until we choose a bearing. So we're going to assume that K is 1.5, and we're going to put our radial loads in. So our induced axial load at A is going to be 0.47 times the radial load at A, which is 875 pound force. We divide that by 1.5, and we find that it is equal to 274 pounds. And just for your understanding, it's pointing to the right. So it is trying to compress that shaft, and it is trying trying to load axially the bearing at B. The induced axial load at B would again be 0.47 times the radial load that is applied at bearing B, which is 625 pounds. Divide that by 1.5 and we get 196 pound force and it is pointing towards bearing A. And so we have these loads that are applied radially that induced axial loads at the bearing. And this is an interesting case because the bearings are indirect mounted. And if the load was applied through the shaft, those would be generating tensile loads. Instead, they're applied through the outer housing. So they are inducing compressive loads in the shaft. And now we have to determine whether or not the induced axial load at A is less than or greater than the induced axial load at B plus the external axial load. And you remember that it is 250 pounds and it is pointing towards bearing A. That was the bearing that was originally squeezed. And so the induced axial load at A is 274 pounds. The induced at B is 196 plus 250. This is less than the sum of those two. And so we have to calculate an equivalent radial load at A is going to be 0.4 times the radial load that's applied to A plus the factor K times the sum of 196 plus 250 pounds. That is the applied axial load and the induced axial load from the 
companion bearing. We are going to use again k equal 1.5 because we don't not yet know what bearing we're selecting. We find that the equivalent radial load at A is 1019 pound force. So there's our equivalent load at A and now we just leave the radial load at B at 625 pound force. We now know what our loads are and we could just go ahead and start selecting bearings. Let's select the bearing for location B. We know that if we look at the radial load at location B, we can solve for C10 by taking the ratio of LD to L10 to the one over A, and we know that A for a roller bearing is 10 thirds, and so we now have to figure out what LD is. The design lifetime has to be converted from hours into revolutions. We know that we have a design lifetime of 90,000 hours. We are going to multiply that by 60 minutes per hour, and we're going to multiply that by the RPM that we're using for this particular shaft. And so we find that our design lifetime is 810 times 10 to the 6th revolutions. We take and plug that up here when we also know that our L10, because this is a Timken roller bearing, is 90 times 10 to the 6th, and we end up with a C10 value that looks like this. And so for bearing B, our C10 search value is going to be 1,208 pounds. Now that I know what my search C10 value is for the tapered rollers, I go to the catalogs to find tapered rollers that can meet that. And I am looking to make sure that they can handle thrust loads and radial loads. This table has metric units in bold and the English units in normal typeface below it. We're looking for something that can handle 1,208 pound force at a one inch diameter. So the only one inch diameter ones that I have begin here here and move down in that direction. You can see the one inch bore diameter. And so I am looking at something that can handle over 1,200 pounds. The closest thing greater than the 1,200 pounds is right here. So I have these choices, these two bearings, and I have to choose both a cone and a cup. And unfortunately, I have placed another image over the cup numbers. But you can see that you would just select something from the table that would match the load requirements that you happen to have for your particular bearing. Now the next thing that happens is we note that our load is good here. We don't have to worry about the axial load on bearing B because it is all being carried at bearing A. But we do have to update our calculation because we assumed that K was 1.5, but instead the actual value of K is 1.45. And so what we have to do now is go back and recalculate so that our our induced axial load at B is going to be 0.47 times the radial load at B is 625. And I divide that now by the appropriate value of K, 1.45. And that tells me that my induced axial load is 203 pounds. And that is induced at B. It will be pointing to the left. We have to recalculate our equivalent radial load at A by taking 0.4 times the radial load acting at A plus K times 203 pound now plus 250 pound. This K is the K associated with bearing A and we don't know what it is yet. So we keep that at 1.5 and then we would have to update it later. So our FEA is 0.4 times the actual radial load that's applied at A plus 1.5 times 453 pound force. And that gives me an equivalent radial load at A of 1,030 pound force. Now I can use that to select a C10. Since I'm sticking at 90% reliability, I already know that I use my equivalent load at A and I multiply that by my design lifetime divided by 90 times 10 to the sixth. All of that is raised to the 3 tenths power. We already figured out LD. It's the same on bearing A as it is on bearing 
B, it is 810 times 10 to the 6. And so my C10 for bearing at A, my C10 is going to be 1,030 pound force times 810 over 90 raised to the 3 tenths power. And that gives me a C10 search value at bearing A of 1,991 pound force. The shaft size is larger at A than it is at B. If you go back to the drawing, you will see I have a one and an eighth inch diameter shaft size on the left side and a one inch diameter on the right side. And so now I have to search for a C10 value in the tapered roller bearing tables suitable to a one and one eighth inch diameter shaft. There are a couple of parting thoughts here before we finish. First, if you have to use a higher reliability than 90%, you take your equivalent loads and place them in this C10 equation, which accounts for the Weibull statistics for your bearing manufacturer. In the case of Timken, the X0 would be zero and that would drop out. You have to find your normalized lifetime relative to the L10 lifetime for your bearing manufacturer. And remember, for Timken, that's 90 times 10 to the 6. For SKF, it's 1 times 10 to the 6th. And you have to use a load application factor to find your search C10 value, which you would then use to select your tapered roller bear. The other important thing here is we have these conditional relationships where we assume, based upon the external load, which bearing is being loaded axially. So we apply an external load and it makes sense which bearing is squeezed or loaded by that axial load. We label that bearing A and we label the other bearing B. And then we check to see whether the induced axial load at A is less than the sum. The induced at B plus the externally applied axial load on the system. If that is the case, then we update the radial load and come up with an equivalent radial load at A that's based upon this equation. And we're using the Ka, which we get by selecting the bearing at A. We never know that ahead of time, so we are starting with Ka equal 1.5. That is always our initial guess. And then we go back and update it. For the bearing that's not loaded additionally by the external axial load, we simply leave the equivalent radial load equal to the actual applied net radial load. Now it's very important that you think about these equivalent loads because if the equivalent load that we calculate is less than the applied radial load at that bearing, then you don't use the equivalent radial load for the bearing selection. In fact, you just stick with the original radial load, which is what this statement is right here.